very early in the morning. <laughs> Roxy Soxy got me up at 5.30 this morning. A good morning. You know what? I think this is the first time we are crossing three different continents in one recording. Anything yes. can happen on Anything. the podcast, <laughs> Women on Top. We can make it happen no matter where you live. That's right, because our guest is in the UK. I am in Los Angeles, and you are in Australia. Honestly, sometimes I don't even know where I am. Like Sean and I will be like driving. We'll be like, oh my goodness, where are we? Because we've been on the road for so long. Like we literally forget half the time that we're in the continent that we're in. I mean, that is such a nice, that must be like such a nice feeling because it's like you feel it's fresh. Not. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, it's, it's a really new day not. every day, you know, something new and exciting. Yeah, no, it's not. It's very, I mean, in, in some mm -hmm. ways, but, um, you know, at some point we're going to settle down in the next couple of months. It's just, we're waiting. I'm here because the, um, the TV show that I'm supposed to be doing was supposed to start this month, but because of the lockdowns in Sydney, everything keeps getting pushed, which, you know, isn't fun for anyone, especially the people in the lockdowns. And it's important to keep everyone safe. It just really is really hard to, really plan anything. And I haven't seen my parents still They're in God. Sydney in lockdown for like, and they're an hour flight. <sighs> um, but they've been in lockdown for, you know, six, maybe four months now. And I haven't seen them in two and a half years. It's just wild. That is wild. So do you think you'll be able to see them before you leave? My, our goal is really to wait until we can see them. Yeah. Um, you know, we're all the way here. We should just wait until how, however long that's going to be, whether it's, another month where there's another four months, you know, I just yeah. think that I don't know if I will kind of forgive myself. Even we'll talk about this with our next guest because mm -hmm. you have to be careful about that. Like, you know, forgive myself or blame or guilt or anything, but I, I feel like there's will be guilt if I leave too soon for sure. Yeah, Cause you came all that way. Right. And it's yeah. like you're on the same continent. I mean, and quarantined yeah. and came in for work. And there's a lot of ways that you, you know, it's, it's hard to come in and we were able to be sponsored through a work project. So I don't know. I feel like we're definitely gonna, gonna wait until, until we get to see them. You yes. Know? And girl, it ain't cheap to fly to and from Australia from oh, here. Oh, it's very, <gasps> yeah. You can't, it's like 20,000. Like now it's like $20,000 a ticket. So no, be a no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like, we will stay here. If this is the last. <laughs> <laughs> we are <laughs> never <laughs> leaving. <laughs> well, good. It gives me, it gives me a good excuse to come visit you. Cause I have never been to Australia. So I would, well, love you must. To Yes. Although um, I don't know if you saw in my stories, but we had a huntsman the size of my hand. What's literally? A huntsman? Okay, a huntsman is a massive spider in Australia. Ooh. Like everything here is like they, they have this running joke that everything can kill you. Yes. Um, but a huntsman is a massive spider that isn't actually poisonous, but it is massive and very scary looking and the size of our hand, my, my hand. And it was in the corner. We named her Charlotte. It was in the corner of the kitchen and like, we didn't know what to do. Cause I, and I put on my Instagram, I was like, you know what, should we kill this spider? Should we not kill the spider? Mm -hmm. And it was like a 50, 50 toss up. And uh, we ended up having to vacuum her out and then relocate her outside. But people were very up in arms that we use the vacuum cleaner. And I thought, excuse me, most of you would have gotten the fucking shoe and <laughs> smashed that to pieces and literally have been none the wiser. So like, <gasps> don't pretend like you're going to have relocated a massive spider the size of your, your hand. Like, I think we did a pretty good job. Um, uh, by the way, why are all the insects that much bigger there? Like, I really want to know, cause I feel like there are like deadly insects all over the place there. Right. There's like the spiders and there's snakes and there's scorpions and like all kinds of things. Um, I'm going to tell this really last story and then we'll get our guest on. But um, we were in the car and we were mm -hmm. driving for an hour back from Noosa to Queensland. And we, our daughter picked this really beautiful little cone, um, like a little uh, shell from the, uh -huh. from the water's edge. And she was in that and she, we were holding this beautiful little shell. And then all of a sudden, this little crabby legs came out. And we thought, you know what? That's such a, it's a hermit crab. That's such a cute little hermit crab. We're going to relocate it. So we like tried to find these really nice little um, areas that we could relocate the hermit crab. And then I got a DM from someone on 
on my Instagram that said, I think that's a cone, a cone snail and they will kill you within, <gasps> within a minute. And there's no symptoms. Like you literally get stung and then you die. Like there's no symptoms whatsoever. And so we start screaming cause we lose the snail. Phoenix is hysterically crying. Sean's like trying to drive and then swerving all over the place. We finally find the snail. We throw it out the window thinking, oh my God, we're going to die. And then there's me going, oh my God, I don't feel anything, but I feel like I can't feel my face. I feel like I've already been stung by the cone snail or whatever it is. And I'm dying right now. So that was an event. It is amazing that anybody, how did you even survive? You know, like growing up. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, how did you survive with tornadoes? I, I don't well, know. Well, you see, that's a thing in Texas too. It's like, you've got all the crazy stuff, the tornadoes and like, we also have like rattlesnakes and yeah. just, you know, but we're tough gals, aren't we? We're tough. I mean, I've seen Twister. Okay. I know what a category <laughs> four is. I know Helen Hunt really had to like work hard to not be sucked up that thing. Yeah, so yeah. let's not pretend that those aren't some scary scary crazy scenes from that from that movie that's so. right that's right that's right yeah we made it we made it tam we're here we made we're it. here well our next guest is someone that has got nothing to do with uh, snakes or snails <laughs> or tornadoes although i could make a metaphor to say that sometimes our children are like tornadoes <laughs> and snakes and scales uh, snakes and uh spiders mm. but you know i remember going on my instagram recently and i was like really overwhelmed with parenting because I've got mm. two young girls you've got a young girl and I just felt like I was doing everything wrong and you know yes we're hard on ourselves because we're moms and that's what we do but I found that I was just having a really rough time and I came across um Sarah Oral Smith's Instagram page she's a parenting author and I was like you know what I need to get her on our show to help all the moms out there who are struggling with you know, with parenting right now, especially in a pandemic. Yes. You know, it's so hard. It's like every day you feel like when you're stuck in this pandemic and you're parenting, like it's sort of like groundhog day. It's the same, but it's like also different because our kids are growing up like while this is all going on in there needs change and the stages of life change. And it's like, even though you feel like it's the same every day, it's actually like can be very different. And it's like trying to adapt and cope with like you know, parenting and your kids, it's hard as, I mean, I'm sorry, it's just hard as fuck. Like this past year, <laughs> I was like, just, say it, Roxy, I'm gonna say let it. it come out of you like a demon. <laughs> let it go. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> let the fox go. Let, let the, the fox, fox go. go. <laughs> if you can't, then what can you do? Don't actually don't let the fox go in front of your children. <laughs> yeah, in the podcast, we can. <laughs> yes, we can. We can. So shall we welcome Sarah, Sarah Oakwell Smith, <laughs> gentle parenting. Yes, from the Thank UK. Thank you so much for what? being here. Good day, mate. How's it going? <laughs> I'm so glad we don't have any big bugs or anything in the UK. Like everything we have is really tiny and not deadly. So I'm really <laughs> glad I don't live where either of you live. <laughs> you guys have teas and teas and crumpets. Yeah, <laughs> and everything yeah, we is have very like pretty and nice. Itty bitty little worms and butterflies and caterpillars, and that's it. Oh, it's so lovely. Yeah. Castles and queens and kings. <laughs> Just so lovely. Mary Poppins in real life. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. So Tam and I rarely talk about obviously parenting on our podcast, but I think, you know, for she and I, we talk about this also is like, it's so hard. I mean, so easy to lose your cool as a parent and try to kind of, you know, you just can't help it. Sometimes you scream, you yell, you kind of like, you know, let the shit fly, especially in this like pandemic year that we've had where we were, you know, confined to being at home all the time. So it really intrigued, you know, intrigued me the title of like your um, Instagram and your website is gentle parenting. So how do we become gentle parents? Do you know, so many people are confused by this. It doesn't mean that you don't, you know, scream and shout and curse and swear. Mm -hmm. It, it's just like a, an ethos that basically means you want to treat your kids with respect. Mm. You know, it's sort of moving on from that old Victorian, what they call authoritarian parenting. Mm -hmm. So where, you know, kids should be 
you should do what you're told and never question anything and you're punished and if an adult says something you don't like then you can't question it you have to just give the adult blind respect Mm -hmm. um and it's it's kind of like a bit of a backlash to that style parenting you know the put a kid in time out and basically what you're doing is teaching a child to hide their emotions and keep them inside but then on the other hand as a society we're sort of preaching about mental health and saying why can't these people talk about how they feel and reach out for help and you're like well because we treat little children that they can't show their emotions and be themselves around us so really it sounds kind of like hippie trippy new age you know wishy-washy but it at its heart it's just treating kids with respect and having a good relationship with them and being understanding and trying to teach them because really you know that's what we're doing as parents is we're trying to raise these kids and teach them how to be good people Mm -hmm. but you don't have to do that with lots of harsh discipline and punishments Mm -hmm. so it's yeah no I mean I I absolutely lose my temper all the time Mm -hmm. and I shout at my kids and I swear lots (laughs) good (laughs) don't say the f word no (laughs) yeah Yeah, so, you know, if you've got any parents listening from the UK, I live in a place called Essex, which is like the really Mm. common place in England where lots of people swear all the time. So I I do lots of swearing or cursing if you're in America, but it's about what you do afterwards that matters. So Mm. it's about when we mess up and just saying to our kids, you know, gosh, I'm really sorry, I shouldn't have done that. That was wrong of me and owning your mistakes. And actually, if we never make mistakes, it's it's really scary because we, Mm -hmm. we never teach our kids what to do when they mess up. Mm. It's interesting because um, I've really adopted or tried to adopt this gentle parenting technique because I had this epiphany, I think it was a couple of years ago. I was like, oh my goodness, there is, there's no such thing as bad kids. I, I don't believe in bad children. I, I believe yeah. in overstimulated children. I believe in exhausted children. I believe in scared children. I believe in children who are confused. Mm-hmm. I don't believe a child is born and they're like, they're trying to do something to really fuck with you because they're bad. I don't believe they fully understand and can control their emotions. And so then what we do is we expect a two-year-old, three-year-old, seven-year-old to just completely, because we've said no, for them to completely understand what that means, even if they're tired, hungry, overstimulated, um, scared, whatever their emotion Mm. is, we don't go down to the root of the emotion. We just Mm. tell them that in general, what they're doing is bad. So what they do, I believe, is they start to like go behind our backs or they start to hide things or they Mm. start to get even more heightened because if someone just said, if my husband said to me, if I asked him a question and I was acting badly because I was anxious or depressed or had a bad day or whatever it was, and he just like yelled at me and I would just yell back (laughs) or Mm -hmm. I just wouldn't want to tell him anything that I was doing or that was going on. So it's not easy, but I've really tried to get to the root cause of the issue. And then Mm. normally we've been able to disarm and dismantle a fight between the two, the two of us or the the siblings. If we really try to get to the root issue of what is the problem. Mm. Yeah. So it's just asking why that's what I always, you know, in my Instagram, I'm asked, I do this um, feature where I get parents to send me questions and I answer them every other day. And so often I'm asked things like, how do I get my child to sleep? How do I make them do what I ask them to do without having to tell them 20 times? Mm. How do I stop them from fighting with their siblings? How do I stop my toddler having tantrums? And it's exactly what you said, you know, it's not about this quick fix solution or say this or do this, mm. and then you will fix your child and they'll behave. You have to say, why are they? behaving like this what's the underlying issue that they're struggling with Mm -hmm. and the really frustrating things is sometimes and actually a lot of the time the actual issue is the fact that they are only two or 10 or 15 Mm -hmm. and their brain isn't fully developed and we're expecting them to behave like us or actually even better than us a lot of the time Mm -hmm. and just the simply the level of development that they're at they can't do it so sometimes oftentimes the why is just because they're a child and they have an underdeveloped brain and they can't do better Mm-hmm. And you the worst thing is when we mm-hmm. sort of, sort of just say we, we punish them when we, we do consequences or punishment or time out and we punishing them for having a kid's brain. It's like it, we don't realize how unfair we treat them. That coming back mm-hmm. to what gentle is, that's just having that fairness and that understanding. Mm-hmm. So let's say, okay, let's say they do do something that, you know, isn't what you would want them to do, or you don't agree with what they're doing, or they're doing something that could possibly harm them or 
what have you. What is the best way to correct a behavior? Like, is it um, punishment is not really what I'm getting is uh, what I'm getting at is I I take it that punishment isn't like the best way to sort of go about it, right? Is to kind of like talk to them, but then how, what's the best way to like correct whatever behavior is the problem? So you have to have a three pronged approach. And I say, imagine it like you've got a tree that has a strong trunk and then two branches. So the strong trunk, the core of everything, the root of everything is us and how we behave and what we role model, because it doesn't matter what we say or do, Mm -hmm. how we act towards others and towards our kids is ultimately what we're teaching them to behave like. So we're the, the strong trunk of the tree. And then they imagine that tree has only two branches. On one branch, it's about the short term or what I call the emergency discipline. Mm. So this is what you're doing in the moment to keep everybody safe. You know, and emergency or short term discipline is about safety. Mm. So this is about when your five year old is smacking the two year old over the head with a heavy toy. You have to stop it. Mm. So that's about going and saying, stop. I will not let you hurt your sister taking the toy away, keeping everybody safe. Or if they're running to a road, grabbing them and saying, stop can't let you run into the road so it's not about doing nothing you have to stop the emergency behavior but what we need to understand is that's not teaching them anything about how to behave in the long run Mm. that's just kind of coping in the moment so then your other branch is what I call the long-term discipline and that's the asking why so why is my five-year-old smashing the two-year-old over the head with a toy how is the five-year-old feeling what's causing them to have such hatred for the two-year-old or to have such dysregulated behavior so it's about trying to have those three approaches all in one So us being a role model, and ultimately, if we want our kids to be calm and kind, that's how we have to be with everybody, including our kids. Mm. And then it's about short term. So that's your boundaries and your rules and your um, stopping things and emergency discipline. And then you have the long term discipline as well. And to, you know, the greatest approach for it to really work, you have to have all three. But you have to understand that you're going to have to keep putting in the emergency discipline because you're dealing with kids that don't have a fully developed brain. So they're going to keep doing the annoying behavior because very often the why, as I said, is just about their brain development. So mm-hmm. it's, it's about trying to keep your head on all three at the same time, but also having realistic expectations that mm-hmm. although we can stop things and have boundaries and limits and emergency discipline, you're going to have to keep teaching this for many months, even years until mm-hmm. your kid gets a bit older. So it's I have a two year old. I know. I know. I have a two year old who is I honestly thought that we had gotten through the terrible twos with we had flown through the terrible twos. Um, but I not the case. Um, so <laughs> lately she is getting very hysterical about things that are pretty simple. For example, yesterday we were in the car, everyone got out of the car, she wanted to stay in the car. She literally would not get out of the car. She was screaming. She was kicking. She was scratching. And so, and please tell me if I'm doing this right and what else I can do to make the situation better. But I always get down to her level. um, So she doesn't feel like she's being towered over. So, and that obviously makes her feel freaked out and want to react more. So I get down to her level and then I start speaking to her and I say, um, and I start explaining the situation. Lennon, mm-hmm. if you're going to be in the car for any longer, I'm going to have to go inside because I have things that I have going on. So you're going to have to stay in the car. And um, and if you stay in the car, you're not going to probably feel good because your mommy's not going to be there. So I just keep explaining, explaining. It takes about six to seven minutes. And then at some point she stops screaming and comes with me. Now, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. I'm. I just assume that, you know, I know she's two and a half, but I assume she has some understanding if she knows how to potty train, she has some understanding of some sort of what's going on in her emotion that like how to really talk to her. So I'm really just trying to talk to her like um, sort of an adult in a way and just try to explain what's going on. And most of the time it does work and we are able to dismantle that tantrum, but sometimes we're not. Are there (laughs) other things? And I'm sure other parents too with toddlers are like, we cannot dismantle a tantrum when it's hysterical and we're in the supermarket. So is there any other tips that you can give us that can really help, you know, moms with small children of like how to stop the hysteria? It sounds like you're doing perfectly. What you've got is you've nailed the trunk of the tree. You're being a great role model. You're being calm. You're, you know, showing her how to stay calm and control your emotions. And you've got sort of great short term emergency discipline. So you're sort of helping her to get through it. You're having your boundaries in the moment. 
what you might want to focus on a little bit more is the other branch of the tree, the long term discipline, and that's the asking why. So you're not going to stop her doing this because she's two and the part of her brain, the frontal lobe that's responsible for emotion regulation, impulse control, actually isn't going to be fully developed until she's in her 20s. And that's 20 years, not 20 months. Um, I have four, four teenagers. They're not a huge amount of different. They're just a lot bigger and a lot smellier, but they still have tantrums. It's a myth that only toddlers have tantrums. Even adults have tantrums sometimes. So understanding that actually this behavior is just her brain not being fully developed. She literally doesn't have the capability to control her emotions like you do. But then I'd also be thinking about, is there anything that makes it worse? So maybe, you know, keep a little bit of a diary over a week or so and just note any triggers. So is she worse if she's hungry? Is she worse if she's tired? So this is the, the why and the question mark. Being three is really, really hard. They have no control over anything in their world. So you imagine like a two or three or four year old, they don't get to decide anything they do. They don't get to decide where they're going or what they're doing or what time they're eating or who they're seeing that day. We control so much of their lives and such a lot of their difficult behavior is them seeking autonomy. It's like, I feel so out of control here. I need to control something. So thinking about ways that she can control more of her life, um, really simple things like letting her control you a little bit during a playtime. So having like a half an hour playtime with her every day and just saying, okay, what should we play? You control the play. So do you, what do you want mommy to be? Do you want me to, you know, roar like a dinosaur or shall we pretend to be cats or something? But let her completely control the way that you play. Mm. Um, and also things like letting her choose what she wants to wear. If there's days when it doesn't really matter what she looks like at any of the little ways that she can have control will help ultimately in the occasions when she can't have it, if that makes sense. So it's it's looking for the, you know, underlying causes of the behavior. So very often just brain development. You know, it, it definitely, um, I think it's really hard too when you are out in public, let's say. Yeah. And the same thing happens um, and you're at the grocery store or something and you're shopping for, and then you have this same scene play out, but it's like in the middle of the market. So like, what do you, how, and you know, you just, you, you start getting the anxiety and you start sweating yeah. and like things get really hot. How do you handle it? If it's like in a public sort of arena like that, where you want it to be like maybe even shorter and you don't really have the luxury to let it sort of play out the natural course, you know? I think you get better at it as you get older. Uh -huh. um, I'm probably at least 10 years ahead of you in parenting and, you know, to pick up on your phrase from earlier, I've reached the give no fuck stage. I don't care what people think of me. I don't care if people are thinking I'm a bad parent or tutting at me. You know, what matters is me and my kids. So you get you get better. You get a thicker skin as you get older. Um, I think it's important if everybody is just full of cortisol and in fight or flight mode, there's no point trying to reason with anybody, whether it's a toddler, a 10 year old or an adult. Mm. So don't get down on the floor and try to reason with them in the middle of a store if they're having a complete tantrum because they literally can't hear you. Mm. You need to just, if it was me, I would pick them up and get them out of the way to somewhere, a quiet corner. Mm -hmm. and then just hold them and wait for everybody to calm down a bit take some deep breaths get outside if you need to you don't have to discipline every situation so I'm not saying you have to do be a great role model and think about the long-term discipline and reason with them at all times sometimes it's not possible mm -hmm. maybe I don't know if you're in a funeral service or on an airplane you just mm -hmm. can't go through all of that mm -hmm. and sometimes as a parent, you're so wrung out. You just think, I just can't deal with this today. Mm -hmm. And if you're like that, then I think it's okay to distract them or, you know, go play or just do something crazy to sort of lighten the moment a little bit, mm -hmm. but just try not to do that all of the time. So I always say, you know, not everything has to be a teachable moment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can cope with it however you need to just to get through it. Mm -hmm. But we need to worry less about what other people think of us. I think for, you know, I'm, as I say, 10 years past the stage you're at now. Mm -hmm. If I see somebody with a kid having a complete tantrum in a store, mm -hmm. I might look at them, but I'm not judging. I'm thinking, geez, I remember those days. Thank God, that's not me anymore. Mm -hmm. okay. And very often I think we read judgment into things that isn't there. And we feel that we need to be this perfect parent and react. But mm -hmm. a lot of that's just in our own head. Yeah. 
it's like you just yeah you just kind of play it out and you're like am i doing the right thing right now you know and you're just like ah oh. but yeah the airplane is yeah. probably one of the worst <laughs> places <laughs> Right, Sam? So if I'm on a plane, I will literally just you here, have my phone, empty my handbag right. out or whatever, just to get through it. Not everything has to be a teachable moment. Yeah. So screen time in that case. might be Absolutely. Okay, right? Yeah. All through COVID, much screen time during lockdowns. Okay. So Sarah, what about when it comes to, um, this is something that I struggle with a lot when it comes to food. I have a, I have two daughters. One is a extremely great eater. She'll eat everything from shrimp to oysters and Roxy's (laughs) kid too, literally will eat anything. But my other kid will not touch almost any food group. She'll eat pizza, French fries, um, you know, she likes ice cream, all these foods that I know aren't good for her body. But I Mm. also know that I, you know, I had an eating disorder when I was growing up and we have to be very careful with the terminology when it comes from like what foods are bad and what foods are good, because you don't want to give them ultimately some kind of complex or issue down the road. So like, how do we talk to our kids about food? How do we not make food seem Mm. like it's negative or positive? And how do we get them to try more things? Because it's really been a hard slog for us with ours at seven, eight year old. Yeah, gosh, I've <laughs> had to, do, I've written a whole book on this. I'm just thinking, how do I condense it down into one answer? Mm. So, you know, I think picking up from what you said, mm. so many of us have such a bad relationship with the eating mm. based on how we ourselves were brought up. So I had huge eating issues in my teen years and actually my twenties as well, mm. that really stemmed from the fact that my mother was a cereal dieter and was obsessed with losing weight. And, you know, I was raised in the 80s era when you had to remember those lean cuisine meals. I don't know if you guys had them in the USA, but mm-hmm. so like low calorie, low fat, fat was really bad. Calories are really bad. We need to do insane amounts of exercise. So by the time I was like nine or 10, I could tell you the calorie counting, like any food. And I was a completely normal sized child, but started my first diet at nine and then kind of spiraled between sort of binging, anorexia and just completely out of control Mm -hmm. and couldn't be trusted around food. And really, that's, you know, I'm in my 40s now and that's kind of really continued, I think, even up until the past few years when I've really tried to sort of get a handle on the way that I eat, which is still the nine year old mentality of good food, bad food, eating too much, not eating enough, you know, fruit and veg and salad are good, but chocolate is bad, cakes are bad, pizza are bad. So I'd have control and then I would binge when I was around it and I thought nobody was looking and, you know, you know the story because it's a really common one. So what do we do then when we have children that actually they all eat really normally because they have young children have something called neophobia, which is a natural phobia of new food tastes. And to understand how they eat, we have to kind of think back to caveman times, you know, think back when we sort of Neanderthal times when, or um, hunter gatherer times when it was really important that nature somehow protected our children from accidentally poisoning themselves. So we wanted to, if you think about, you know, your mother nature and you're designing a way to keep curious young kids who put everything in their mouth safe, what you find is if something grows beneath the surface of the earth, Um, And it tends to be kind of white, yellow, or orange and slightly sweet and very carb heavy, but it's not poisonous. It's rarely poisonous. All Mm. the poisonous stuff grows above the earth. And that's normally either really sort of dark reddy colors or very green colors. And the green in in nature, very green food contains something called PTC, which is um, an enzyme which is incredibly bitter. So if you think of green foods or very dark, sort of ready, healthy foods, what we would taught is healthy, they actually have a very bitter element. And young children are kind of very repulsed by this bitterness. But the other thing is that as we get older, we damage our taste buds and things don't taste the same to us as they did when we were young. They taste much milder. So, you know, mm. if you tasted kale or Brussels sprouts when you were three, they probably tasted very different to when you're in 30s. Mm. So what you find is that as we get older, we eat more. Mm not necessarily because we become more adventurous, but just because everything tastes slightly less. A quarter of us is something called super tasters, which means we have this genetic um, link, which makes us taste things more strongly, but particularly bitter compounds. So what you'll find is young children basically eat the things that are safe for them, which is 
carby vegetables that grow beneath the ground and anything that is generally white, beige, yellow or orange. So everything you've just said there with the pizzas Mm -hmm. and the bread and the cheese, because all of these are safe. None of them have very bitter tastes. We are, Mm -hmm. as a species, when we're young, we automatically favor a savory, sweet, slightly salty taste and automatically veer away from the sour more ones. So the way that you've just described is really, really normal and common. What you will often find is that children will eat well, until they're about 18 months, maybe two years of age. And then the fussy and the picky eating hits. Um, And so you've got the issues that I've just spoken about. And then you've also got the issues of the sensory aspect of eating. So when we're weaning babies or with helping toddlers, we will go in and wipe their hands and say something like, yuck, messy, dirty, ew, and we'll clean them up. Mm. And then they will eat saucy food Mm -hmm. and they won't like it because because that texture is related to being dirty and messy and yucky. So you've Mm. got the sensory aspect. And then you've also got the fact that I said earlier that a toddler doesn't control anything in their life, but they absolutely can control what they eat. Mm. So you end up with a bit of a battle of wills and they don't eat because it maybe has nothing to do with eating. It's just a way that they can exert their autonomy over things and say, hey, I can control what I eat. And you end up with a real battle of will. So the three of them together, basically, it is really common for them to not eat in the way that we do in the first five to 10 years of childhood. Mm -hmm. What we know from the research, actually, is the best way to get through it is just to keep offering the food. Don't add any emotion into it. If they don't Mm -hmm. eat it, take it away. Put food in serving dishes and allow them to serve themselves. Be a great role model. Mm -hmm. Be really patient never label food good or bad don't reward them or praise them if they eat good food definitely never praise or reward Mm -hmm. them if they finish their food and clear their plate Mm -hmm. because what you're doing is praising rewarding overeating Mm -hmm. and they learn that when they eat lots they feel good because they feel praise for being Mm -hmm. a good eater Mm -hmm. and they associate that and that's basically comfort eating in later life so it's for parents i think understand the biology understand it's nothing you've done wrong it's really normal it will pass give them a great vitamin supplement in the meantime and Mm -hmm. just keep all emotion out of food. But I think the best thing I can recommend for all parents is we have to start with our own relationship with food because we will pass our disordered eating on because it's so triggering, isn't it? For us, when our kids don't eat, it triggers something deep inside us from our own childhood. Yeah, it does. It does. And it's like, you want, you know, you're trying to instill healthy eating to some degree with them. You know, you obviously want them to eat foods that nourish their bodies, but it's like, yeah, you just run that slippery slope where you're like, oh my God, am I making this like so mental for them? Like this whole eating thing, you know? But it's like, I know with me, with my daughter, I run into the problem of trying to figure out what she wants to eat, let's say for dinner. And my husband and I have very different approaches. I'm of the like, okay, here, we'll have two or three, you know, different things. And she can choose one of those. Whereas my husband likes to leave it very open-ended. Like, what do you want, honey, (laughs) you know, for dinner and kind of like a short order cook, you know, like where he, you know, well, and to me, I didn't think that that was the best way to sort of handle it. I thought it was more, you give them like a controlled sort of, you know, few choices. And then within that, you know, they can eat what they, you know, what they choose from that. So which way is correct? Or are those both wrong? (laughs) Are they both right? I don't know. I think, there's, there's an element of privilege in it as well, isn't mm-hmm. it? You know, can you afford to use up right. all this food and discard the food and make all the food? Um, okay. You're privileged for time. I don't have time to cook everybody different meals. Right. So I cook one family meal. Mm-hmm. And I, as I said, I serve everything up in serving dishes and the kids help themselves. It's much better to not put, serve up their food on one plate, if that makes sense. Let them okay. have the control about what goes on their plate. Okay. But I would always try to make sure that there is a safe food in what I'm offering. So if I'm serving a a spicy curry, Mm -hmm. I know that we'll at least eat plain rice. Um, And if they don't eat what's on offer, then they get a very plain, quick, sort of nutritious, slightly filling alternative, Mm -hmm. something like toast and nut butter or oatmeal or 
and mm. that's it there's like a couple of things that take a two minutes to prepare and that's the only thing that's on offer if they won't eat what I've made mm. so there's always a safe alternative and they never mm. have to eat it if they don't want to and I would never force them and I don't chastise them and I don't reward them if they do eat it it's just here's the food I've prepared it it's here now you have the control of whether you eat it or not if you don't eat it you know that you can have the oatmeal on the nut butter on toast or something Mm-hmm. and just take the emotion completely out and it's you know, it comes back to what it's triggering in us from our own upbringings mm-hmm. that I think we have to deal with more than them yeah Tamman what, what do you do for that do you like leave it open-ended when you're cooking dinner for your kids or do you give them like certain like three choices and then like within that they yeah. can kind of pick what they want you know I'll be I'll be honest I feel like it's a shit fight when it comes to food in our house. Not with our small daughter, with our two-year-old, she literally will eat anything. Like to the point where you you be careful what you wish for because anytime I make food for myself, she'll eat all my food. <laughs> so I'll be like, no, it's not like every time I get a coffee, like a, I get decaf coffee or oh. make some eggs, like literally I won't eat a salad, she'll eat anything. Um, but the problem is my husband's a vegetarian. My daughter has very specific food habits. The eight-year-old who she's kind of vegan, vegetarian. My two-year-old will eat anything and everything, loves to eat meat. So we don't eat meat in our family. So it's like, you know, I'm preparing it for her. I eat eggs. So like everyone has a different meal. And I find that that to be really difficult. So I'm not in the kitchen cooking as much as I would say most moms or dads do because I find it so overwhelming. So what we start doing, and that's probably my issue why our daughter has such a limited palate is because I, we just kind of give her what we know she likes, like, which is quesadillas, um, beans, green beans. She likes broccoli and some like raspberry or smoothie. It's literally the only things that she'll have, Mm. but because I'm so exhausted and so over it at the end of my day, I don't want to go and fight with her Mm -hmm. every, every night. So I just give her what I know she'll eat. But then the issue is like, that's not healthy as well. And I want her to like, feel like she's having all the different food groups. So, I mean, it's hard. Like what you're saying is absolutely correct. I just find it to be difficult at mealtimes for our family. Yeah. But she is actually eating those major food groups. What you've just said, you know, believe me, I've worked with people and their kids will only eat chicken nuggets, fries, and you know, something else, bread. So actually, you know, quesadillas, broccoli, beans, I'm like raspberries. It's like, actually, that's that's pretty broad. I'm sure it doesn't feel it to you. For a young kid, that is quite broad. Hmm. So what I would do is if that's what works for you and you know that she eats and I would keep doing that. And then you're thinking about that three pronged approach again. So in the short term, you need to just make sure she's fed. Mm -hmm. so giving her what she eats helps there but then Mm -hmm. you've got the what am I setting as an example here do I need to eat around her more invite her to join me I talk about having carpet picnics Mm -hmm. so having sit down on a mat on the floor in the garden wherever and just share the food Mm -hmm. rather than having it on separate plates and make it quite a social event get her involved in making it more growing more if you have a garden but Mm -hmm. thinking about as an adult what sort of an example am I setting around eating am I happy with how I eat and how my child is seeing it? And on the other hand, you've got that other branch, which is the asking why. Why are they like this? Well, the answer is probably because this is normal for young children. Mm. And then you're thinking, you know, are there ways that I could introduce other foods? So what I'd be doing is serving up other things as well. So you've got the quesadilla and then you add something else on the plate as well, but there's no pressure for her to even try it. Mm. You just keep on introducing the food. Just put it there. Make absolutely no mention of it. Just serve it up. And if she doesn't eat it, that's fine. Take it away. If she eats it, equally ignore it. Don't praise. Mm. Just keep offering those new foods. And it may take a hundred times before she will even try it. Mm. But it's about just offering. You know, there's no pressure to taste it. There's no pressure to eat it. There's no no chastisement if you don't eat it. It's just there. Mm. But keep offering. And then I think it's, again, it's about getting things straight in our own heads. You know, what is it actually we're really worried about? If you actually sit down and work out the nutrients she's eating, she's probably getting mostly what she needs. Mm -hmm. Is there a good supplement you can boost if it's something that she isn't? Um, And thinking about why am I so worried right now? You know, this is normal. We probably ate like that when we were younger. They do grow out Mm -hmm. of it. You know, Mm -hmm. when 
my eldest is 19 now and wouldn't eat anything green until he was about 11 or 12 mm. and is now you know happily eats almost everything so yeah. it, they do change it just doesn't change as quickly as we would like it to and we take it all to you personally in the meantime you know, it's such an interesting thing that kids eat by color like that a lot of the time. Cause like my sister yeah. growing up would only eat white things. So my yeah, mother- because white, beige, yeah. yellow, orange is safe. Right. It's safe. It's like, she'd just eat bread, pasta, yogurt, like, and my mom, my poor mom was just like, oh my God, this child is not getting, you know, the nutrients that she needs, yeah. but you're right. They eventually kind of grow out of it. I definitely have a question too about, um, like when you pick your kids up from school, um, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I feel like- <clears throat> When I pick my daughter up, I want, I'm interested in what she's done, you know, the, during the day. And I want to know what she's done, but I feel like I maybe bombard her a little bit too much right at that time. I'm like, tell me everything about your day. You know, mommy wants to hear it. <laughs> like, uh, tell me, you know, I want to know it all. And I feel like she shuts down, you know, and mm -hmm. she's kind of like, I don't want to talk right now, mommy. I need like quiet time you know, and she'll tell me that, but does that mean that she doesn't want me to be a part of this, um, a part of this, um, you know, chat with her or what, 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 do, what, do, what do, how do I handle this? The, the easiest way to answer is say, imagine that you've got a, a fairly newish job and you're mm -hmm. finding it quite hard. You know, it's mm -hmm. quite hard to learn what you're doing. And some of your colleagues are quite difficult. Maybe you don't get on so well with some of the colleagues and, you know, your boss is a bit difficult. Maybe your boss tells you off now and again, and you're trying to find your feet and every day is really exhausting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've been really, really trying not to shout and swear at your coworkers or mm -hmm. answer back to your boss because, you know, that's what a good employee does. So you've been holding it together all day and you're really exhausted. You know, I think we've, we can all remember a job or something we've been on when it's been really hard work and we've prided ourselves for holding it together. Mm. And then imagine you come home and the second you walk in, you're through the door, your partner, so tell me what happened. What did you use today? Who did you speak to? Blah, 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 blah. And you're like, oh, I just need to have a coffee or a drink, or I just need to sit down and decompress. And I just need some space. Mm -hmm. And we're adult enough that we could say, look, please don't take this personally. <laughs> this isn't because I don't love you and I don't want to talk to you, but I just can't do this yeah. right now. And we might take ourselves off somewhere quiet or say, you know, I just need, can we just, can we talk about this tomorrow? Right. I'm shattered. Mm -hmm. And they don't have the sort of the emotional maturity and vocabulary yeah. to phrase it like that to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they end up sulking or slamming themselves you know slamming the door shutting themselves in the room mm -hmm. shouting go away to us or something and the other thing is as well where they've been holding in all day sometimes they don't want to talk to us and sometimes they actually end up really poorly behaved with us so lots of shouting lots of tantrums lots of mm -hmm. angriness lots of tears mm -hmm. and again all that is is because they've been holding it in all day so mm -hmm. it's like imagine you've got a, a bottle of fizzy drink with a lid tightly on so they've kept their lid on all day they've managed to hold these emotions in and be good and well behaved and they've been shaken all day and they right. get home and they're with the people they feel safe with mm -hmm. you know they know that you love them unconditionally and they know that they can be authentic with you mm -hmm. and it's like they get home and oh, thank goodness I can undo my top now and let out everything that's been sort of kept inside so then you have this big explosion of tears or tantrums or slamming doors or shouting or hitting siblings or whatever it is. Mm. And it's just the explosion of what they've kept inside all day. Mm. And then imagine then you've got that and you're being asked what you did all day. So right. it's not <laughs> at all about you. Mm -hmm, um, no. The best thing I still remember actually being like 11 or 12 when I started high school and my parents picking me up at the end of the day and instantly I would get in the car and I knew they would say, what did you do today? Mm -hmm. And I hated it. I, I still remember how much I hated it. Mm -hmm. And I remember being really rude. And it was simply because I just didn't want to talk about it there. And then the best thing to do is when you see them at the end of the day, give them food, mm -hmm. instantly give them food because they're normally already hungry and thirsty mm -hmm. and then give them space to decompress. So mm -hmm. whether that's, you know, let them watch cartoons for half an hour, let them go and run around and play somewhere and just kind of busy yourself, but be near them. So if they want to talk, then you can talk with them, but just give them space and bite your tongue mm -hmm. and let them decompress, let them eat, let them rest, let them watch TV or whatever it is they want to do. Mm -hmm. And then, 
you could talk to them about your day. Say, well, this is what I did. And maybe they may engage back with you then. But I tend to find the most common time that they will spontaneously tell you about their day is bedtime, mm. which is normally the time of the day where you're like, oh, just hurry up. I want you to go to bed because mm. I'm exhausted and I've got to get your mm. sibling to bed and I've got to do everything for tomorrow. But I think maybe making a bit more time for bedtime at the end of the day and having mm. your conversations then is the yeah. time that I think they need to reconnect you with you the most and actually the time that they will normally open up with you the most. Mm, that's it's hard because like parenting is like, I, I feel that a lot of the time subconsciously we make it about us. I mean, I don't know if you feel that way, Roxy, but like mm-hmm. for me, it's just like, what you said is so correct, but you think like, well, you know, you, you love me like, oh, maybe I just do. And I need to have, you know, I need to go to therapy, but it's like, love me at the end of the day and, and tell me your stories right. and, and, yeah. and eat the food that I made for you because mm-hmm. I love you so much. And, you know, snuggle with me and hold me and, because we love them so much and we obviously our kids love us so much. I mean, I love my mom so much, but yeah, like at the end of the day, when I used to be on um, a a TV show home and away, I'd get home and like everyone would know that when I walked home, shut the door, Tamman wasn't going to talk to anyone because she'd had such a big day and she just didn't want to, she was exhausted, Mm -hmm. you know, but it still hurts. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't (laughs) hurt other people, but I feel like it hurts. Like when my daughter comes back from swimming and she's like, I don't want to talk about it. And I'm like, where have I (laughs) failed? Like, what have I done wrong as a mother that you don't want to talk to me? It all goes back to like guilt and oh my goodness. Like, why don't you want to talk to me? Wow, did I fuck up? I don't know if other people feel that way, but I do. Everybody no, it's does. True. It's true. And you feel like, you feel like, oh God, is it? Am I losing like the connection, line of connection with them when they, you know, mm-hmm. shut it down like that? And when they don't want to talk, you're like, wait, are they like asking me out? Like, am I yeah. like, is this, like, is this the beginning? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> we we made it about us. Yeah. It's not yeah. about us. You know, if you remember yeah. being a teenager or eight, whatever, you, you've you been in that position that your kid is in now and you know that you still loved your parents and that you mm-hmm. just needed a break. But mm-hmm. so I've literally just spent the last six months writing a book about this. And mm. when when we approach parenting, we come to it with, you know, so much baggage. And I call it like a jigsaw of things that need to be in place to help us to be calm and mature as a parent. So you've got, you know, the most obvious thing is what happened to us in our own upbringing. The fact that we tend to unconsciously treat our kids in the same way we were treated, Mm -hmm. or if our kids disrespect us or something that we would have got in a lot of trouble for as, as kids, we almost feel the sort of the hurt and the indignation because we know we would have been punished for that as a child. Mm-hmm. So you've got your own upbringing. Actually, yeah, probably everybody would be better to have therapy because however mm-hmm. great your parents are, everybody makes mistakes. Mm-hmm. And we all have issues from our childhood that I think we could all do with working on. But then to add to that, we've got the you know, the fact that we have to work, we have to bring in money. And there's that Mm. quote, isn't it? We're expected to raise kids like we don't work and work like we don't have children. Mm. So we're, we're balancing that. And then we're balancing partnerships with, you know, romantic relationships and parents and siblings and friends. And then we've got, you know, all the damage we do to ourselves, like trying to be perfectionists and the comparing ourselves and like social media, which is so unbelievably toxic on the one hand, but also so important to us as parents on the other hand. Mm -hmm. And it's like we're this big kind of tangled mess of so many issues, but we tend to think that the issue is our child. Mm. with almost all parenting issues but actually it's probably what we're bringing to the table kids are very simple and very straightforward and very open and very honest (laughs) they have they're very mindful or in the moment in their needs it's like they have Mm. a need there and then but we respond with this big tangled mess of baggage Mm. and it's Mm. it's yeah it's kind of what you're saying when your child doesn't talk to you and you feel unloved that's not about your child at all that's about yeah how we feel but yeah you know how do we get around it what I've basically realized is having written 12 parenting books is it is actually not about what we say or do to our children it's what we say and do to ourselves that matters mm. which is That's a big... even harder than trying to be nice to our kids all the time is that we actually now more than anybody else we need to be nice to ourselves mm-hmm. and we're not very good at doing that Mm-mm. 
that seems like that would make so much more of a difference. Yeah. That's hard when you you're, you know, in your thirties or forties and you're a parent and, you know, you have these things that are already set, you know, how, so how do we undo those things? Like, how do we do this? How do we Mm -hmm. love ourselves more? You know? Yeah. It it basically starts, you know, it's a long process. There's no magic solutions. I think we have Mm. to start with thinking, you know, what, what am I carrying from my past? It's making me hurt today. What sort of unresolved feelings do I have? What else is making my life difficult at the moment? So for me, one of the mm. things that I'm really bad with is boundaries and saying no to people. Mm. I'm a real people pleaser. And actually a lot of our generation are because we were raised to be compliant children to please adults. Mm. And we tend that overspills into our adult lives. And we tend to be people pleasers. Like we don't want to say no to anybody. We want to always be nice, even if it makes us really exhausted or angry or, you know, it's mm. not good for mm. us. So learning how to say actually no right now that's not good for me thanks Mm -hmm. so much for asking but I'm at full capacity right now Mm -hmm. and just having more boundaries for yourself stop comparing yourself to other people um you know working on a little bit in your adult relationships and I think you get to a certain point in life when you realize actually not all relationships are salvageable and not all relationships work for you so maybe Mm -hmm. you may lose a friend here or there or something Mm -hmm. like that Mm -hmm. so it's about I think really A lot of what I'm essentially talking about is self-care, but I don't use the terminology because in parenting, people think self-care means like bubble baths and yoga and massages and stuff. And it Mm. isn't that at all. It's just self-kindness. So it's being Mm. aware of what your trigger points are, what your sore points are, and just giving yourself a bit of time and grace and space Mm. and being kind to yourself and just thinking, you know, okay, I recognize that. I've just said something that my mom said to me when I was 12 and I've, it's, <laughs> I've reacted like that way because I've got this hurt teenager inside of me and you know, that's okay. I'm, I'm able to be like that mm. and just, you know, forgive yourself. I think more than anything else, it's like, a, it's a really long process that basically just starts with goes back to what I was saying, you know, with gentle parenting, Mm. more than anything, it's about being gentle to yourselves, not gentle to your children, because if you're not gentle and kind to yourself and forgiving for yourself, Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what you do, you will never succeed in this style of parenting with anybody else, Mm -hmm. because you'll be so full up and so full of emotions and like a sort of a waiting to blow that it doesn't matter what you say or do to your kids. Mm. There's two really big before I, I know Roxy's got questions too that I really need to know the answers to before we leave. But um, the, the number one thing is for me, I don't know if I'm, uh, can we even say the word discipline is, I don't even know if that's a dirty word, mm-hmm. but like, for example, if my daughter is doing something, like if we say, you know, don't, don't touch, don't touch the, the, the pan on the table because I don't want it to break. Or don't, don't touch that plate because it's a nice plate. I don't want it to break. And we go, okay. And then she touches it. And then I say, mm-hmm. okay, can you just not touch the plate because it's a special plate and it, and it could break. And then she touches mm-hmm. it again. So then I try to discipline if that's mm-hmm. the term we're allowed to use by saying, okay, if you do that one more time, because it mm-hmm. means something to me and I don't want it to break. Um, then you're going to have to have a consequence. And Mm -hmm. this is what the consequence is going to have to be. Um, Or we can find a solution right now. If you can give me two to three solutions of what you think we should do, we should probably say, well, then move the plate. Um, She could say, okay, well, mommy, I can't help myself from not touching the plate. Why don't you put it up there? Or mommy, can I find a new plate that I can play with or whatever the solution she has? And then we pick it. But sometimes she comes up with her own solution and then she'll do the thing that I told her not to do. And then we'll have the consequence, which is probably (laughs) not good because it's probably not to do with the plate. Just say, we'll say, well, we are not having ice cream, which is no correlation. Then she'll scream because we didn't give her ice cream. Mm. And then she's throwing a tantrum and screaming, like shutting the door. And yet we can't get through to her. So that's how I feel some of our discipline goes in our household. So I want to know how to better that. And what am I doing wrong? So (laughs) yes, you, of course you discipline. Discipline comes from the Latin word disciplina, which just Mm -hmm. means teaching. Mm -hmm. Um, It's about teaching and learning. So I think every time you think discipline, it's really difficult because in your head, probably from your own childhood, discipline means punishment, Mm -hmm. but we need to switch it and think discipline means teaching. So what's your goal here? 
I want to stop it in the moment, but I also want to teach her to respect things better next time. So let's mm -hmm. go with the example of the plate. You answer this yourself. Remember when I said not everything has to be a teachable moment? Mm -hmm. There was such a simple solution to what you've just said. Mm -hmm. But we run into all of these, oh, I've got to do this natural consequence and the logical consequence. What we should have just done was move the plate. Right, right. Please don't touch the plate. Move it somewhere high so she can't touch the plate. This plate's precious to me. I'm going to put it here. Mm -hmm. so sometimes we overlook the simplest is it Occam's razor isn't it you know the simplest solution is actually the easiest solution is actually the best answer mm -hmm. so think about am I over complicating this and trying to look for some sort of long-winded discipline answer mm -hmm. when if they're you know really misbehaving if you're a, a, a playground or somewhere the simplest answer is you just go home right and we oh. over complicate things so much at that point you don't have that doesn't have to be a teachable moment it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be a disciplinable moment you could have just moved the plate mm -hmm. and so many times we try to make something disciplinable when it doesn't have to be if you I'm really not a fan of consequences because mm. we tend mm. to confuse them and they very quickly become punishments that actually teach them nothing so mm. if you think about consequences there's three types there's a natural a logical and illogical Natural mm -hmm. consequences happen without any involvement from us at all. Mm -hmm. So the natural consequence of your child touching the plate is maybe it would have fallen on the floor and been smashed. Mm -hmm. So it's, we can't make them happen. We can only stop them from happening. So mm -hmm. like if, mm -hmm. if your child was reaching into a fire to get a, a log that was on fire, that's really hot, the natural consequence is they get burnt. Mm -hmm. So obviously we will, most of the time we want to stop a natural consequence. So then you're left with two, which is the logical consequence and an illogical. An illogical consequence is one, it's basically a punishment that has no logical link with the child's behavior mm -hmm. and your punishment. So mm -hmm. if you touch the plate again, you won't have ice cream, no logical link to that. Also really difficult on the eating front because then you've put ice cream up on a pedestal. That this is this wondrous food that you can only have when you're good, which means then when you're 18, you're going to go and binge on Ben and Jerry's when you're feeling really bad. But so we want to make sure there's a logical link. Um, could be that the child's done something. You say, I'm going to call Santa. Santa's not going to come mm -hmm. because you didn't tidy your room. Mm -hmm. There is no logical link between tidying a room and Santa coming. The child can't learn anything from that because they can't predict mm. what the bizarre punishment that you're going to give them is. Mm -hmm. They can't learn from this really illogical mix of touching plates, ice cream, tidying room, Santa. So mm. if you do have a consequence, you want to use a logical consequence, which is where there's a logical link between what they've done and the um, resulting sort of not punishment but the, the agreed behavior mm. so it could be that you know your child had a ball in your house and they were throwing the ball around and you said please stop doing that otherwise you're going to break um, my lovely fruit bowl or something and they mm. haven't listened and they've broken your fruit bowl so the logical thing to do there is that they repair it obviously they can't put together ceramic or a glass bowl mm -hmm. another logical solution there is that they pay to replace it so mm -hmm. if they have pocket money that their pocket money could go towards replacing a new one mm -hmm. the difficulty with that is they have to be kind of old enough to mm -hmm. have logical thought processes so by that I mean they have to understand if I do that, then that would happen. Or if I did that, then that would happen. And if that happened, this is how I fix it. What I have just described is the thought processes we don't really see until about seven years of age. Mm -hmm. So if you're using that type of consequence on a little child, they're, they're not learning anything because they're not, they literally don't have the thought processes possible to understand what's happening. Mm. So you're kind of wasting everybody's time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that I wouldn't use them because I think it's good to get into practice, but I think it could very quickly become a, a punishment and we can very quickly fall into a punishment mindset, mm. which is why going back, the easiest thing when they're little is to think about what could I learn from this situation? Because remember, discipline is about teaching and learning. It's not just about teaching our kids. When they're little, it's about us learning, learning mm. about child brain development and what we should do so if the child wasn't listening it would be for me it'd be that short-term discipline going over stop I've said you can't touch that I need mm. to take it away from you I'm not going to have a discussion with a three-year-old or a four-year-old because mm. it's a complete waste of time mm -hmm. I'm just going to very firmly say stop I told you not to touch that you don't need to do anything after that move on you don't have mm -hmm. to have a long lecture about why you weren't allowed to touch it because they don't really understand they won't process it like you
Mm. So it's it's a little bit like if you had a puppy mm. and your puppy broke something, you wouldn't try to inflict some strange punishment or consequence <laughs> on them. You would learn, I really should have kept my puppy gate closed or moved this out of the way. Mm. So you are still disciplining, but it's about you learning and it's about, I guess, setting them up in an environment where things are easier for them. Um, Mm. But absolutely take things away from them. Say no, be stern. Sometimes I would have to yell if I couldn't reach them quick enough to get them to stop doing something. Mm. If I, you know, if they were going to go up and hurt their sibling, I'd be stop. I will not let you hit until I could Mm -hmm. go over and sort of grab them and sort of move them away. Mm. But in that instance, you know, it's so many times it's like we punish children for having a children's brain. If they say, I can't help myself. You're saying, well, I'm going to punish you anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if we had a child with a physical disability, we wouldn't punish them for not being able to walk or run. Mm -hmm. But when they're little, in essence, we're punishing them for having an underdeveloped brain. It's it's actually a physical thing. We're almost discriminating against them Mm -hmm. by giving them a punishment because their brain is not mature enough to handle it. Mm. So fascinating. Um, you but know, that also doesn't mean that they get away with everything. It doesn't mean that we're just like, yeah, whatever, just smash up my house and hit the sibling and pull the cat's tail. <laughs> have at it. <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, you know, it's interesting. Um, Tam and I both have seven-year-olds, and I notice um, with my seven-year-old, she seems to be trying to assert her independence more uh-huh. now, more than ever, you know? And it's like, she's really sort of, she's not doing like, quote unquote, like naughty things, but she will try to do the opposite of what I'm doing just to like have it her way or have it, you know, her own way. Um, And I know that we're supposed to be encouraging that and that is a good thing, Mm -hmm. but it does break my heart a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. that she's wanting to do this. So how do we continue to sort of foster (laughs) that like sense of independence? You know, you want them to grow into these like really developed, you know, independent people. But it's like, you know, it is like, you know, they are tearing away from you in a a lot Mm -hmm. of ways, you know. And you have to let them go. You know, the hardest thing when you first have children, you have a baby or a toddler and they're so clingy and they won't leave you alone. And they literally have to be in your arms all night. And Mm -hmm. we spend the first three years of their life Mm -hmm. thinking, I just want a break. I just Mm -hmm. want to sleep without someone starfishing little limbs next to me. (laughs) And we're just so desperate, aren't we, to just have a break. Mm. And it's so difficult, that initial, that matrescence, the initial transition to motherhood when we just we're a single person and then we can almost become merged with our little person and we're so mm-hmm. desperate to have that little bit of normality of just us and then you have a transition period between sort of four five six and seven mm-hmm. where it's actually quite a nice balance you get more time to yourself but they you are the center of their universe still mm-hmm. and then they hit the tween years the kind of, sort of seven eight nine to thirteen years and that's absolutely the time in their life where they need to move away from you a little bit but you've Mm. spent seven or eight years growing Mm. this beautiful attachment Mm. and now we need to kind of give them their wings and it's Mm. you know it's a lot harder to give wings than it is to grow roots because I think again this says so much about ourselves we can often fulfill sort of the need for more love and attachment that maybe we didn't have when we were younger with our own kids so again it's about so much more than just them but they need to push us away they Mm. need to discover who they are without us they need to test boundaries they need to be rude to us because they're literally practicing social interactions with us before Mm -hmm. anybody else there's um, also a dip in empathy that naturally happens in the tween and teen years so a lot of people say oh they're they're just so selfish and so rude and so nasty but it's actually two things there a lot of things are blamed on hormones and it isn't hormones you know trust me seven years won't have hormones for another three or four years Mm -hmm. it's absolutely not hormones whatever you know male or female it's two things. It's their brain development, which is more similar to when they are a toddler than they are now. We make mm-hmm. the mistake of thinking they're older and more mature and more intelligent and we can have normal conversations with them. So we we kind of think their brains are like ours, but they're not. They're radically different to ours. Mm-hmm. Um, they won't mature properly for another 10 to 20 years Mm. but also they have this dip in empathy because it's important for them to work out who they are away Mm. from you and to work out who they are and you know who they want to be and in order to do that they have to focus inwards so Mm. they have to kind of sever a little bit of connection with you 
and we tend to call them self-centered or selfish or you know Mm -hmm. all words that we use in this age range and it isn't it's just them finding a sense of self Mm -hmm. and it's so important that we don't take that personally it's not about Mm -hmm. us we've not been a bad parent in fact you know if they feel capable to say sometimes rude things to you then actually it's normally testament to the fact that you've got a good relationship that they feel safe <laughs> and it's you know it's the, time in, that, it's the yeah. time in parenting I think that every day <laughs> they must really respect me <laughs> yeah. I must be the light of her entire universe <laughs> but we have to change again it's like you know this sort of mm. a second stage of parenting that what you'll often find is people either have another baby or mm. they will get a puppy or they go back and start working again. It's sort of like throwing your extra nurturing or your need mm. to grow and build something into something else. But it is about us again, as much as it is for them. Mm. And they still need the boundaries from us. Mm. But what they really need is for us to remember how we felt at that age. You know, mm-hmm. we all know the answers because we've all been there. You all know how you felt at the same age. And then just to keep that sort of communication open. So I would say, you know, if they were really rude to me, I'd say, I don't like it when you speak to me like that. I don't appreciate you using those words, but I can hear that you're really hurting or really upset Mm -hmm. about something. So you're sort of ignoring the rudeness and seeing the emotion beneath it and just trying to keep that connection going, (laughs) which actually often very looks different. So it may be if you have a boy, for instance, they'll often go off and want to play computer games. So rather than the nice reading session or cooking session you would have, it's like, oh, can you show me how to play Minecraft or Fortnite or something? And you bond that way. So it's kind mm. of changing how you are with them. But yeah, it's it's a tricky period. And, you know, <laughs> things do change. You've got mm. quite a few years, but in my eldest now has come right back to where he started. And we are super close. Like I have hundreds of text exchanges. He's off at university and the hundreds of miles away but it's Mm. so nice that when you keep that open they do come back to you just Mm. slightly differently but yeah safe place you know and and exactly we had a conversation on my dms um about spanking and uh i am very against it because i believe that kids watch what we do and they emulate it, especially when they're young. And it's yeah. like, I would never, if I smacked my husband, I would probably go to, if I was hitting my husband, I'd go to jail. You know, like mm-hmm. if I was hitting Roxy, she, she would not be in my life anymore. And yet we feel <laughs> like the smallest children, like mm-hmm. the smallest beings who are learning and growing and don't know we hit them we use physical Mm -hmm. abuse well back in our parents day and and even before that I think it was much worse like two three generations ago and then it kind of started to peter out Mm. um but before you go I just I just want you to talk about the psychological damage that smacking Mm -hmm. does to kids because you know the dms that I got were like well I don't believe that smacking my kid lightly on the butt is going to do them any psychological damage and I'm like I want to hear from an expert um parenting author why that's not the case Mm -hmm. so you know you think it's not very common but actually the research indicates about 60 percent of parents still spank smack their kids it's still really common but yeah I mean you've answered this haven't you who else are you legally allowed to hit in your life If I hit my husband, my grandmother, my friend, my dog, I Mm. would be, you know, in the UK, there things like abuse against animals now is becoming illegal. We we would be in prison. Mm -hmm. And if you misbehave at work and your boss hit you, you wouldn't learn, would you? What we do when we hit children, even if we give them a tap across the bum, you know, lightly, it, it doesn't tell them what they did wrong. It doesn't teach them what they could do better next time it basically just teaches them to not confide in you Mm -hmm. to not talk to you about their feelings it causes them to what we call internalize their behavior so if they've been hit because they were naughty in some way and they've basically naughty behavior is either um poor um, impulse control which is normal in childhood or they've just got these big feelings that they don't know how else to let them out so by hitting them what you're basically saying is that your behavior is unacceptable you are unacceptable your feelings are unacceptable do not show them around me do not ask me for help or how you can resolve it in a better way Mm -hmm. I'm just going to sort of hit you and hurt you to get compliance and a lot of people who hit children are under the mistaken belief that it causes respect, but it doesn't. It's fear. 
and compliance and fear and compliance are not remotely the same as respect it doesn't mm -hmm. teach that so we know from the science that um it causes the brain to develop in a slightly different way particularly the area that's responsible for impulse control and emotion regulation is very underdeveloped compared to children who weren't hit even tapped um, but more importantly, if you link it to mental health in later life, because these children will internalize, so they'll, they will learn when they've got these big, difficult feelings to keep them inside because their parents are going to yell at them or spank them. So they mm. keep them inside. What we know from the research is that it's likely to come out in one of two main ways. So it's likely that they will either externalize it in later life. And you commonly see this. I know this sounds like stereotyping, but there is a difference in the research. So what you're likely to find is more common with boys that they would externalize that behavior and they are more likely to become violent. So mm. whether that's, you know, get into fights or even if you're talking maybe domestic violence with partners, um, with girls. And again, obviously they're, it is it happens to some boys and some girls, but girls are more likely to internalize the behavior. And mm. what you're more likely to see with them is things like self-harm, eating disorders, alcoholism, substance abuse, mm. or just really severe sort of anxiety and depression because they've kept all of these big, difficult feelings inside. They don't go away when the child is quiet because they're scared of being hit. They just build up inside and you'll often see this passing from generation to generation. And actually, it's it's kind of a bit of a version of Stockholm syndrome where mm. we learn to almost empathize and attach to our abusers mm. um, and, and kind of, I don't know, you know, not really see the harm that's been caused to us because we're trying, we are we caring and loving the people that abuse us and that passes down through centuries mm. and we kind of learn that when kids are naughty this is what happens to them and you'll see like generation upon generation upon generation upon generation it just going from generation to another and it needs somebody to break the chain and say hey you know I know that I was hit and my parents were hit and my grandparents were hit and my great-grandparents were hit but actually has anybody stopped to ask if this is actually okay but the other thing is, is it's such a bad form of discipline it doesn't teach them anything mm -hmm. if you think about discipline as teaching and learning we are not showing them how to behave better we're not mm -hmm. helping them to resolve problems that are, that are stopping them to behaving in a, in a better more respectful way it's it's not disciplining at all because there's no teaching mm -hmm. so it's it's like it's it doesn't even work that's the other thing if you look at the research that spanking and smacking doesn't improve behavior you may get short-term compliance, but in the long term, the behavior just gets worse. Mm. So it's not even like with inflicting that much damage, it isn't even effective because it's not. It's mm. interesting. You're building fear and insecurity. And kids also learn to lie to get away with things better. Exactly. You know, that's one mm. thing we make them yeah. is we make them more devious and we make them learn to lie and hide things. And mm -hmm. believe me, when you've got a teenager, what you don't want is a teenager who hides all their problems and troubles mm -hmm. from you. You mm. want them to think, you know, when they do something wrong, you want them to think, oh, goodness, I've got to ask my mum for help. Not, oh, my gosh, I've got to hide this from my mum. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you so much for yes. cl clearing that up because I don't have the expertise you do. And I'm like, because I think smacking is wrong. <laughs> um, but but I think, you know, do you know what? That just answers it just as yeah. well as I did, didn't it? Yeah. 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 Oh. It's just food morally rocks. <laughs> Lots of food for thought, I mean, Roxy. I yeah. should stop hitting you, Roxy. <laughs> you cannot hit me anymore, okay? <laughs> okay. Maybe maybe we'll be better friends if I stop whacking you on the face. <laughs> right? No, I mean, so many good things to think about. I feel like you have given us like yes. such a great perspective. And thank you. On parenting. Yes. Thank you. I mean, that is just like I it's so many things. And you speak so eloquently about about it. So thank you so much for coming on. Oh, and thank, thank you, you for your time. And I feel like I could talk to you um, for hours. I'm like, yes. this is my free <laughs> parenting therapy session. Please come back. Sarah will be like, uh, I don't know who yes. this girl is. Stop DMing me. Uh, like, Sarah, so last night my kid asked for tiny teddies. Um, yeah. What should I do? <laughs> Block, delete, delete. <laughs> Sarah, could you let our audience know where everyone can find you? So um, I am on Instagram as just my name, which is Sarah Ockwell Smith, O-C-K-W-E-L-L -L Smith. Um, I'm on Facebook just under my name as well. Um, 
where else am I? You know, pretty much anywhere. I've got a website with loads of free articles, which is sarahoglehartmansmith.com. Also on YouTube is my name. Um, and bookwise, probably the book that summarizes what we've discussed is called Gentle Discipline, which is, you know, like anywhere you can buy books. Mm. amazing well you've written 12 books uh, you said so i'm gonna now do audible all 12 yes, yes. <laughs> starting tonight <laughs> starting tonight i will be a better parent yes um yeah so great um this is my favorite one of my favorite subjects to talk about this and sex so i feel like <laughs> <laughs> they kind of go hand in hand i mean with yeah sex, well sex to get the that. kids <laughs> maybe i need to stop and then i'll have less children <laughs> um but thank you so much uh we are so grateful to have you on you guys okay. please uh follow us on women on top official on instagram and women on top podcast on facebook and we have a group on clubhouse women on top and don't forget to rate right subscribe and comment on your favorite podcast app yes amazing <laughs> and um i am tamin sursock and i am roxy manning and we are women, women. are